All right, by way of announcement, some of you in this church are already acting under your spiritual gift. I won't need that. I think I, I shouted loud enough last time. I think uh, I think my voice will carry. Not much. Do you think it won't carry? I think it'll carry. All right. <laughs> well, I'll just shout even louder today. All right. So by way of announcement, I know that some of you are already functioning un under your spiritual gift, and that's because uh, some of you have uh, uh, been doing things that deacons should do. And there are deacons that's listed in the Bible, and if you're a deacon, uh, you have certain administrative gifts. And I've noticed some of those gifts in action already, even before those gifts have been um, officially given, but gifts don't have to be officially given. In fact, uh, God the Holy Spirit gives you a spiritual gift the moment you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you believe in the Lord Jesus, I will do SOP this time. So when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will get a uh, spiritual gift by means of the 40 things that you received. And we will study the 40 things that believers receive as part of the basic series. And before I forget, we will do the standard operating procedure. So, the next few moments will be devoted to silent prayer that gives each of you, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, the opportunity to utilize the privacy of your priesthood. And in the privacy of your priesthood, you can utilize 1 John 1, nine. And in 1 John 1, nine, it states, If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. And that's what the Bible says. And it says that so that we might, under grace, know that we can have a unique spiritual life simply by naming those sins to God and then we will be filled with God the Holy Spirit. And uh, so with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, we will take these next few moments to pray so that you might name your sins to God. And by naming your sins to God, you will be filled with God, the Holy Spirit. And it's important, because God, the Holy Spirit, will uh, make it able for you to uh, understand these things. And when you are filled with God, the Holy Spirit, you will uh, understand what I'm about to teach because it takes the filling of God the Holy Spirit. And without it, you won't understand a thing. Not a thing. I hope you understand that. You won't understand a thing without the filling of God the Holy Spirit. And you might be bored, and that's okay. But my goodness, this is important. And I want you to understand how important it is, and if you're bored already, you're just not going to make it through this message. So, uh, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity tonight to study your word. It is a time in which we can study your word and grow in grace and grow in knowledge, and it is a time in which... Uh, uh, we can uh, be approved without having to be ashamed when we reach the Bema seat. And the Bema is going to be something we're going to study shortly. So, Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have tonight to study your word as it is the most important things, thing in our life. In uh, Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now, we're going to be looking at sin from a different angle. And, in fact, we have uh, four different standpoints we can look at sin tonight. And um, I have to tell you a little bit about what happened to me over the weekend. And a man needs to know his limitations. And that's part of humility. And um, I failed in that regard in some ways that a man needs to know his limitations. Now, uh, earlier, I started out on a, uh, was it Sunday? It was Sunday. I had the Sunday service, and I sat up till 3 o'clock Sunday night, 3.30 actually. Saturday. Well, it was Sunday morning. And then Sunday morning, I got up and came to church. 
And what happened was um, I suffered from um, uh, all the classic symptoms of a heart attack. And it was. And I've had this happen before to me. And I, I have a, a heart disease. A, a part of it is the heart disease. And uh, doctors... Now, you have to get on doctors, by the way. Sometimes they won't listen to you, and you have to jump on them and say, uh, let's get with it. Uh, you know, tell me what's going on. Get me, you know, do some type of test, but they won't unless you jump on them about it. And uh, thank God, uh, by the grace of God, I, I, I work in the medical field. And by the grace of God, I do, because in the medical field, I know some of this terminology. So I can look at the doctor, and I can say, look, I type uh, some of the notes that uh, doctors type, and uh, and therefore uh, it's okay if you're nervous. <laughs> but I type some of the notes that you type, and uh, I understand that uh, the doctors today they go through a lot of study and uh, eight years in college and eight years of all of that that they have to go through to know the things that they know, and they do know a lot. But a lot of times, not in all cases, but in some cases, they get an arrogant attitude about themselves because they think, I know all of these things, and they do. And I understand why they get that type of attitude. And they get that attitude because there are people who are always down on doctors because of, uh, well, they say, well, you just want my money, and you're doing this to do this, and you're doing that to do that. So doctors uh, receive just about as much criticism as a pastor does. And uh, that's the way it goes. And so when it comes to care, because of people's old sin natures, people don't get the care that they need. But I'm going to get the care that I need, and I'm going to go to a doctor, and everything's going to be fine, and I'm going to be up here teaching. And if I uh, drop dead in the pulpit, good. <laughs> you will learn something. You will say, the Word of God is the most important thing in your life. And if I were to just fall over, go listen to the Colonel. Listen to the Colonel tapes, and you will learn the Word of God. And this has been the happiest I can tell you right now. I'm going to get a little personal with you because I'm being a bit sentimental. That's what happens when you get close to death. You get a bit <laughs> sentimental. And so I'm going to tell you, uh, as sentimental, this has been by far the happiest time in my life, and in fact, I'm doing something that I enjoy up here, and I, I'm sorry, I enjoy it very much, and, uh, and, uh, all right, let's continue with the Word of God, <laughs> all right, and uh, on Sunday, by the way, Sunday morning, uh, I got out of church Sunday, and my parents looked at me, <laughs> my parents looked at me, and they go, what in the world? <laughs> They didn't know what I was teaching. Well, they knew what I was teaching, but they thought uh, they saw something that uh, maybe something was wrong with me. So they looked at me and they said, "What? What was all that about that Sunday?" And um, and I wasn't drunk. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I'm not drunk now either. It's just the fact that uh, when you have these health problems, it, it, it causes things to happen in the brain, and uh, the fact that the blood's not flowing as it should, and I'll get that checked out is the fact that uh, since the blood's not flowing like it should, I feel a bit weird, a little lightheaded, a little strange. So if I fall out, well, okay, just call the ambulance. <laughs> but I'm up here uh, tonight, and I do feel a little lightheaded. But, but it's uh, the Word of God that I need to be teaching. And in teaching the Word of God... I'm, I'm here tonight. I shouldn't be. I might, maybe I should be sleeping. But I'm going to be here, and I'm going to teach it, and I'm going to come back Thursday night at 7 o'clock. And let's take some points now. If I just rely on the notes that I've taken instead of trying to go off the top of my head, I might be all right. And let me say uh, once again, I am not drunk. <laughs> some people, well, some people get weird ideas, and I know they could, but it's not. It's a health issue. And I, don't, I wouldn't come to church drunk. That's stupid. There's no way. So, uh, the old sin nature, point one. The old sin nature has an area of strength and an area of weakness. The old sin nature has an area of strength and an area of weakness. 
and um, uh, the area of strength uh, produces human good. Let's take a look on the board up here. Look at that. <laughs> I'm not complaining. I don't mind about <laughs> the blindness. You do go blind, though, if you stare at that long enough. All right, we have an area of strength and an area of weakness that we start out with in uh, when we uh, get under the old sin nature. And in the area of weakness, uh, we produce what's called human good and evil. And let me write this up here on the board, on this board up here. I'm just going to put A of S. That means area of strength. Area of five, whatever. And then over here, area of weakness. Now, in the area of weakness, uh, we will uh, commit sin... Uh, for example, in the area of weakness over here, it should have been on the other side, but this is fine. In the area of weakness, when we commit a sin from the area of weakness, uh, for example, um, let's say we have a trend toward fornication, like the Corinthians did. In Corinthia, they had an a, a extreme trend toward uh, fornication. So they would commit that sin. And so from their area of weakness, they felt weak, so they would commit uh, that sin. But from the area of strength, you say, I would never commit such a sin. Fornication? I would never forget, uh, uh, commit fornication. So from the area of strength, you say that, but yet you will malign and gossip this person over here. So from your area of strength, you're maligning and gossiping. And that's what we're going to get to today. And it's going to be great. I can't wait to get to it. And I'm very happy that I'm going to be getting to that tonight. And, uh, I thought I'd be in heaven by now, but I'm not. I'm right here, and uh, that's for a reason. And I plan to stay here. So, uh, point two, there are trends of the old sin nature, and we have legalism and antinomianism, and that's what I talked about uh, last week. And in fact, I, talk, I talked about this the week before last. I talked about... Uh, antinomianism and legalism and the fellow said well didn't you talk about some big word that uh, he couldn't pronounce and that's uh, normal you wouldn't be able to pronounce uh, something like this so I'm going to uh, write it up here because it is important and we all need to know it that on one side we have antinomianism and on the other side we have legalism so, on um, this thing keeps moving around. That's because there's two sheets. Well, I'll just do this. No, that ain't going to work either, is it? Bear with me. All right. So, right here, on this side, antinomianism. Anti. Gnome. That ain't going to work. Let me do this again. I'll do this out here one more time. Make this a bigger circle. Please bear with me. On this side, anti gnome e an ism. And then on this side, legalism. Now, what is this? You say, those are big words. They are. What is it? On this side, legalism. Legalism judges everybody. They're, they're judgmental. They are legalistic. Uh, they have a, a, a gossip. A lot of people gossip. I'm still blinded by that light. So if I can't look at you, it's because I'm blind. So legalism, on one side, it says, uh, you, uh, you're an adulterer or you're a fornicator, or uh, uh, you do this and you do that. So the legalist always judges the antinomian. Now the antinomian is out raising hell. They're out uh, getting drunk or uh, going to bars and then uh, finding some uh, woman or man 
uh, be it if it's a man or a woman, and then they go out and have a one-night stand. And that's the antinomian. And the legalist over here looks at the antinomian and says, uh, you're wrong. Well, of course the antinomian's wrong. The antinomian probably knows he's wrong. But the problem with the legalist is they usually don't know that they're wrong. When they judge somebody over here, usually they're using self-justification. And they say, a uh, person over here, you're committing adultery, you are wrong. And they talk about it. Maybe they talk about it all week long. And they do talk about it. And then, after the legalist does this, uh, about the antinomian, well, uh, the antinomian don't know what's going on. They're just out raising hell, having fun, doing what they do. And it's not that sin is fun. Well, it could be. I mean, you could, uh, instead of being here, you could be watching television tonight. I'm glad you're not, but you could be. And if you were watching television, well, that's not necessarily sin. But what you're actually doing is, uh, well, if you're not with doctrine, you don't have to be here. You can be listening to a tape or something else uh, on your own. But if you accept my authority as your right pastor, well, then, if you're at home watching TV or something else, what are you doing? You're playing uh, the harlot. You're an I you're uh, going after an idol, and you want you say, well, t uh, television's more important than the Word of God, and then you say, well, I'll just get it on tape. You can, you can get it on tape, but most of the time it's an excuse. But I won't get into that right now. We're we're talking about the difference between antinomianism, and on this side, and I'm glad to see people taking notes. That's wonderful. On a antinomianism. They go over here, and they just raise hell, and then legalism, uh, they uh, like to judge these people over here. Both are sin. They're, it's polarized. That's what it's called, polarization. And on, let's say, this North Pole, this is South Pole, and they just, they're polarized, and they're in conflict all the time. So the antinomian, antinomian is always in conflict, uh, conflict with the legalist, but up top... Uh, I won't write it, but we have the spiritual life. We'll say that's up here. And the unique spiritual life, if we're in this, we're above all of that. We don't get involved in that squabble down there and that terrible squabble uh, down there. And um, this is detailed, and it might be boring. And I'm sorry. I really, I, maybe it's my, maybe I need to uh, say, maybe I need to talk to where it's not so boring. So, uh, let, that was point two. Let's move to point three. Uh, all of us have a lust pattern in the old sin nature. All of us do. We have a lust pattern. Maybe in your sin nature you have a lust pattern toward uh, those things such as uh, money lust. Maybe you lust after money or maybe you lust after sex or maybe you lust after... We all have a lust pattern and we'll get to that. And uh, so, point three, uh, you have a lust pattern in the old sin nature. And I'll pull this off of here, and then we'll make a new one eventually. So we all have a lust pattern in the sin nature. Point three, uh, that's what I, lust is a distraction. Lust is a distraction in your spiritual life. If you're under lust, you are definitely distracted. And if you remain under lust for an extended period of time, it can directly lead to what is called the Dysukos believer. And if you're Dysukos, what's that mean? That's found in James. And in James, it talks about the Dysukos believer, which means you are double-minded. And what's double-minded? Psychotic. Uh, you can get psychotic by your choices. Now, not every disease. Now, sometimes you can be psychotic from diseases like lupus. Lupus can make you crazy. And, and that's because the uh, flow in the back of your head is not working right. So you can be crazy, and it's not your fault. I mean, that's just not your fault. It's biological. And you can have other diseases, and you can have a stroke. And if you have a stroke, that's going to mess with your brain. And in fact, it's going to destroy a lot of neurons. And that's not your fault. But in a lot of cases, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ can um, suffer from mental illness. 
And that has to do with the fact they make bad decision after bad decision after bad decision. And by doing so, they end up suffering under a mental illness. Now, if you suffer under a mental, mental illness, you can uh, take your medicine. I'm not telling you don't. You should. We have today the greatest medicine on the face of the earth that can help mental illness and help it in many ways. And a lot of times we can have a situation in which we have a mental illness that is outside of what uh, that we can help. Sometimes uh, we've been in an environment in which we can have, uh, for example, if you grow up under child abuse, and we will study child abuse in Matthew, and under child abuse that is a terrible, terrible thing. If you suffer under any type of child abuse from, uh, let's say, maybe your parents abused you or whoever, uh, maybe uh, somebody abused you and you never told anybody about it, and so therefore uh, you kind of uh, uh, get a little crazy. And that's normal, you should, because there are defense mechanisms that you use when you are a young person. If you are abused sexually as a young person, you will start to use some abuse uh, uh, mechanisms. And you will say uh, to yourself, you will, uh, because uh, along with uh, sexual abuse comes guilt. And if you have been sexually abused, you will suffer from guilt. Uh, definitely you will. And uh, guilt is destructive to the spiritual life and everything else. Yet you have a defense mechanism that you use when you are sexually abused. And you use that def defense mechanism. And, uh, for example, uh, when you're abused, you might not remember it. You might not remember when you were uh, uh, five to eight years old. You might not have a clue about what happened during that time. You might have been sexually abused. Maybe not, but maybe you maybe you were. You were, and if you were uh, sexually abused uh, during that time, not remembering it, well, uh, God still gives you a spiritual life. You still have something. You know how to get out of all that mess? Do you know how to get out of the uh, abuse uh, mechanism? Because when we uh, are, receive abuse, we have a mechanism that kicks in immediately. And we say to ourselves, uh, I will repress what just happened. I will, I'll just put it aside. I'll never think about it again. And in fact, you do forget it. But if uh, in the spiritual life you finally uh, come around and you say, I'm going to listen to the Word of God. And when you listen to the Word of God and put that in your soul, uh, that is the moment in which you finally have happiness for the first time. And an abused person cannot have happiness until they receive the Word of God. And when you receive the Word of God, you receive happiness. And that's the only time an abused person can receive, can receive happiness. An abused person can't be happy without the Word of God. It's the only solution. Now, there's medicine that can stabilize you and if uh, you take your medicine. And a lot of times you have to take your medicine and listen to the Word of God, and that's fine. Uh, sometimes you need that medicine because it's been uh, such a phenomenal... Um, uh, people have learned through medicine that there is a phenomenal amount of uh, help that comes from that. And if you uh, take medicine for any type of mental illness, don't be ashamed. It's not, you shouldn't be ashamed. What you, sh you should be uh, thankful that you have that medicine and take it. Don't be ashamed of medicine. Uh, we have phenomenal medicine in this country, and uh, that's part of the grace of God, by the way. And God wouldn't have made this medicine if he didn't need if he didn't uh know that it would be helpful to us it's helpful to us and a lot of times the only way we could concentrate on the word of god is with the help of that medicine and that's true and uh, if you take some type of uh what's called psychotropic medication fine take it please do do you won't be able to learn this without it you would uh, be so upset the whole time that you wouldn't be able to learn the word of God. So if you need those medicines, don't be ashamed. What a terrible thing to feel ashamed. Don't feel ashamed about it. If you need it, take it. And, uh, and that way you can live a normal life. And that's wonderful. 
So I believe we just finished number three. And so now we're be, uh, moving on to number four. And lust. Now this is a listing of the lust pattern of the old sin nature. And lust includes power lust. Now politicians have power lust. And oftentimes parents uh, can have power lust. Or anybody can have a power lust. It just doesn't have to be a politician. Um, by way of example, if a, uh, for example, a woman has a child and then suddenly uh, she tries to take out her authority. All, she knows she's a, the authority of her children. So she wields that authority with great, um, um, well, she overdoes it. Let's put it that way. She overdoes her authority because she has it and she's doing it just because she has it. And that's a part of power lust, and it occurs a lot. And then it moves into child abuse. And so uh, we'll study that when we get into Matthew, and that will be a fascinating study when we get into it. So lust includes power lust. It includes also approbation lust. Now what's approbation? Approbation is approval. If you seek the approval of other people, you are in lust. That is a lust. If the only thing you want to do in life is to have approval lust, then uh, you will seek the approval of people all the time instead of seeking the approval of God. And how do you get the approval of God? Well, first of all, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Simply believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore you have approval lust at that moment. And then, if you uh, want to have approval in the spiritual life, you will uh, grow in grace and in the knowledge of your Lord and Savior. Now, a lot of people come to church simply because uh, they're having a hard time. Uh, suddenly in their life, they're having a hard time. So they come to church finally, and they say, I'm, I'm having a hard time, and I need to uh, come to church because I want to learn some Bible doctrine. Uh, finally, you should have been here earlier. Now, I'm saying this off the top of my head. It's God the Holy Spirit just grabbing me and telling me what to say because I, this isn't written down. So I'm going to tell you uh, what I need to say. What I need to say is if you're here simply because you have a problem in your life and you suddenly say, I need to get with the Word of God, you should have been here to start with. You should have been listening to the Word, to the word of God to start with. Now, I, I don't mean to be picking on anybody, and I'm not. I'm just uh, uh, telling a principle. Let's keep going. Why did I do that? I don't know. Let's keep going. So you have a lust pattern in the old sin nature, and if you operate under your lust pattern, you lose the ability to live your unique spiritual life. And therefore, we have the importance of naming our sins and disregarding those things which are behind. And I'm going to have a book that's going to come out, and it's going to be called Name It and Dis. Regard it, and that's what you do. When you name your sins, you uh, disregard them. In other words, when you commit a sin, and you know it's a sin, and you say, Father, I have done thus and so, and that's what you do, and you're forgiven. And then you disregard it. Don't think about it. Don't tell God you'll never do it again, because you're lying. You will do it again. Just disregard it, name it, and disregard it, and that'll be the book, and it'll be coming out, and it'll be back here on this table in which you can pick it up. So point four, lust includes power lust, approbation lust, and I just told you what that is. And then we have, uh, we'll go past that, and we have sexual lust. And sexual lust is uh, part of the lust pattern. And chemical lust. And what is chemical lust? Uh, drug addiction and alcohol addiction. Uh, drug and alcohol abuse includes the chemical lust. And monetary lust. If you lust for money all the time, then you lose your spiritual life. If you lust for money all the time and you say, well, if I just had this much money and that much money, I would be fine and just, I just wish I had that much money. But that's part of lust. And if you lust like that all the time, you lose your spiritual life. You need to be filled with God the Holy Spirit. And if you're lusting after money, you are not filled with God the Holy Spirit. You have to be filled with God the Holy Spirit. And then you say, the cattle on a thousand hills are his. That's what the Bible says. Do you know that when it comes to money, the cattle on a thousand hill, hills is the Lord's? It's the Lord's. He can apportion to us at any time. For example, I could have a hundred books now. I don't. 
But if I, <laughs> but I could have a hundred bucks right now, and the Lord could say, "Well, I want to give you um, a billion," and He could, because the cattle on a thousand hills are His. And if He wanted to, He could. But I don't have it for a reason, and I don't have it because if I had a billion bucks, I wouldn't be here tonight. <laughs> I'd be out doing something else, having fun, going on vacation. Well, that might not be true. I might be here, but that might not be what, that might be why I'm not rich. Because there comes a capacity. When you have money, there's a capacity related to money. If you don't have capacity for money, and if suddenly you win the lottery and you have in your pocket $50 million, let's, let's say you have $50 million, and suddenly you have that. When you have that money and you just, uh, and suddenly you have it, well, maybe suddenly you won't care nothing for the Word of God. That's why there's a capacity related to it. Some of us would be miserable with $50 million. Some of us are happier now with nothing. I'm happy. I'm happy with nothing. So, let's continue. And so I went through power lust and approbation lust and also uh, monetary lust and sexual lust and chemical lust and then crusader lust. What is crusader lust? Crusader lust is the idea that you can change the world, and that's in your arrogance. I won't push on that too hard. I remember what last happened last time. <laughs> so, in uh, crusader lust, it's the idea that you can change the world. You think you can go out and just whitewash the devil's world, and that's all you're doing. And I hear it on the radio all the time because when I'm going to work when I'm able lately to go to work, I will go to work and I will hear on the radio somebody will say, well, uh, abortion is murder, let's get rid of abortion. And what they are doing, they're trying to whitewash the devil's world. It's not your place. Not at all. What you need to do is grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And when you do that, that is when you have an impact on the country. Not by trying to whitewash the devil's world through that pathetic energy of the flesh. And that's what it is, a, a pathetic energy of the flesh. So the idea that you can whitewash the devil's world is a part of crusader lust. And then we had an inordinate ambition, which results in inordinate competition. And you say, what are those words? That means it's sexist. Excessive. Inordinate ambition plus Inordinate competition means excessive competition or excessive um, ambition. And then we have after that a lust for revenge and then pleasure lust. And you will find pleasure lust in Second Timothy. So we have the function of the lust pattern in destroying your spiritual life. The lust pattern will destroy your spiritual life. So the function of the lust pattern in destroying your spiritual life is as follows. And we have about 20 minutes. I'm sorry. <laughs> Point one. The lust pattern of the sin nature eliminates or destroys Bible doctrine as the number one priority in your life. What should, excuse me, what should be the number one priority in your life is the Word of God and you're writing frantically as if you're scared of me. <laughs> the lust pattern of the sin nature eliminates or destroys Bible doctrine as the number one priority in your life. And for example, let's say you have a uh, lust pattern that operates under approbation lust, which is approval lust. And that means the number one thing in your life is to have the approval of other people. And teenagers go through this. Teenagers want to have approval from other people, and they think they'll be happy if people like them. But you don't need to have approval from people. Now, it might be nice, of course, in your soul, in your depraved soul, because all of us are depraved. We are born depraved. We are born with an old sin nature, and therefore we're depraved. And in our old sin nature, we want to have a wonderful social life, and that's fine. A wonderful social life with people who have Bible doctrine would be wonderful, but you're not going to find that around here. So when you look at a social life, what you need is just to learn the Word of God, and social life will follow. Social life will follow when it comes to the Word of God. And if that's all you're wanting, we'll go to, you can go to any church out here. Highway 28. I believe. Is that 28 out there? What is it? 24. Okay, well, 24 runs into 28, which runs into 85. And all the way down through there, there are churches. 
and church after church after church. And if you want to socialize, go to one of them places. They'll give you a social life, but what else will you get? Nothing in your soul. You will have nothing in your soul. And when you start to die, do you know what happens when you're dying? I'll tell you this from experience. When you start to die, and when uh, you think uh, you're over the toilet vomiting like a, a maniac, and just blah, and then uh, you, you start to think, well, I'm dying. And then when you start to think that... Um, you realize that there's only one thing that's important in life, and that's the Word of God. And uh, at my funeral, play this tape. <laughs> but that's the Word of God. Because uh, when you start to die, you realize there's only one thing that's important in life, and that's what you realize. And you realize that uh, everything in life, you have to live your life in the light of eternity. Do you know nothing else? really matters. And it's a wonderful thing. That what, what would be wonderful? Now, if you were to start to die now, you might freak out. And you might say, I don't want to die right now. But it's a wonderful thing when you uh, start to die and you realize that, you, realize that you've done everything that you have been uh, designed on this earth to do, which is to glorify the Lord. And when you have glorified the Lord and you start dying, you have a wonderful peace about you. And in fact, you might even start laughing. <laughs> and um, other things related to that. You just, uh, just say, well, I'm going to go be with the Lord. It's a wonderful thing. Ha ha. Bye bye, everybody. And that, that's what you do. And uh, of course, you feel sad in a way because uh, you don't want to leave those loved ones behind whom you love very much. And you don't want to leave them behind. But when you're dying, if you have the Word of God, you're going to have something that is so wonderful and so peaceful. And you're going to have something so peaceful that it's just going to, you're going to, and the only way you can have that is by listening to the Word. And you're not going to have that with social life. If you think you have a great social life, when you start dying, it's not going to mean a thing and you're going to be scared to death. You're going to be like, oh no, I'm dying. And you're going to cry your way into heaven. And it's a sad thing because you should be happy when you're dying. And when you're dying, you should be happy. And you can be from the Word of God. You can be extraordinarily happy only from the Word of God, not from social life. You say, I have a million friends. I'm happy. No, you're not. Because when you start to die, you're not going to be happy from your friends. I was preaching. All right. <laughs> So lust divorces, this is point four, lust divorces the believer from reality. Lust divorces the uh, believer from reality, and if you remain under lust for an extended period of time, it can directly lead to the Daisukos believer. This sounds familiar. Did I say this before? Have I repeated myself? No? Well, it might just be part of it. Point five, lust turns the believer into a tricky and deceitful person. Lust turns the believer into a tri tricky and deceitful person. Point six, lust destroys the motivation to glorify God, and it turns the believer's motivation into self-promoting. Now, what does that mean? When you are self-promoting, you become what is called a, lo uh, a user. And you, you want to use people to promote yourself. You want to um, use people so you think that uh, you'll have a uh, better standing in life by using people. And so uh, lust is part of that motivation. So let's take a look at the emotional sins, and we'll get going through this because I need to get through all of these sins, and we need to hurry up. And I'm sorry if you're bored again. I'm really sorry, but I can't help it. I, this is the Word of God. You shouldn't be bored. You shouldn't be bored when it comes to the Word of God because this is how you have happiness. And if you ever get close to death, you'll understand that. You will understand, because if you die without this stuff, when you start to die, you'll say, I've missed out. And you will. That's what you'll say. But if you have these things, then you won't say, I've missed out. You will be happy 
and you will laugh your way into heaven and it will be wonderful. And that's the way it happens. That's the difference between dying grace and the face, uh, the sin face to face with death. And we'll be studying the sin face to face with death, if I'm up here. We'll be studying it. The sin face to face with death. And it'll be a, it, and it's a horrible thing because uh, you will get scared. The paradox of the situation. Yes. Like the early morning anger leads into the afternoon anger. That's true. It is a paradox. So it is it, actually, actually. Go so into so it, we'll be happy or happy and come, come in coming like a lion, roaring like a lamb. That's true. And it's a paradox to the situation, as you said, because the greatest paradox, and I'm glad you said that, because the greatest paradox in our spiritual life is when we get to heaven. And when we get to heaven, there's going to be a paradox. And it's going to be called a shamedness. Now, when we get to heaven, uh, we're, we're going to be, if you've believed in Christ and you go to heaven, you're going to be saved. And you're going to be happy there. But there's going to be a paradox because uh, when you go to heaven uh, and be you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, therefore you're going to heaven. But if you've not lived the unique spiritual life, if you've not grown in grace and in the knowledge of your Lord and Savior, when you get to heaven, you're not going to have the wonderful rewards that we get in heaven from doing so. You're not going to have those things, and that's a paradox. It's an oxymoron, in other words. And what's an oxymoron? That means that you will be ashamed in a resurrection body. And when you're in a resurrection body, if you have not lived the unique spiritual life of all times, you will be ashamed. Ashamed before the Lord, because what will the Lord do? He'll get before you and He will say, what have you done with the most unique spiritual life of all human history? And you'll have nothing to answer and you will be ashamed. And that's a paradox. You'll be happy in heaven, but at the same time you'll be ashamed because you have not fulfilled the unique spiritual life. And that's part of what you think about when you're dying. When you start to die and you're uh, laying there and halfway unable to breathe or whatever you're going through, and uh, you're starting to die and you say uh, to yourself, um, uh, I'm dying. Now, if you don't have Bible doctrine, you're going to freak out. You're not going to know what to do. And that's just a fact. It is a fact. And you need to understand the importance of it. It is important to know the Word of God. It's extraordinarily important to know the Word of God because if, when you get before the Bema, which is called the evaluation, which is part of the judgment that we receive as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, if we get to the Bema and we have not learned these things, these things that I'm teaching, if we haven't learned them, then you will be ashamed. All right. So we have sins related to fear, and this is part of emotional sins. We have emotional sins, and that's part of point one, sins related to fear. Point two, we have sins related to hatred. This is part of the emotional sins. Sins related to hatred, and that includes anger, violence, and murder. And then we have sins that are related to self pity, and that is you feel sorry for yourself, and there is sin regarding feeling sorry for yourself, and you might feel sorry for yourself for having to sit through this hour. Well, that's your fault. And then point four, we have sins that are related to guilt, and guilt, there's no place for guilt in the spiritual life, and that's a big problem when it comes to Christianity today, because the people on the legalistic side, let me show you what happens, and this is what happens to people uh, today, to uh, Christianity today, this is what happens. On one side, we have legalism, and on the other side, we have antinomianism. So here, we have legalism and then slash anti gnome and innocent. And I know we just studied this, but I'm going to repeat because it's important. And so I'll put a circle around that. Legalism and antinomianism, and if you can't see that, that's A-N-T-I-N-O-M-I-A-I-N. Let me do it. Let me just spell that out for you. Anti nom ism. So that's how that's spelled right there. 
That's how that's spelled up there. So, on one side, now what the legalist does, the legalist gossips, maligns, and judge all the time this person over here. They say, uh, you've committed fornication, and you might have, and they judge you for it. And then they say, you've committed thus and so, and thus and so, and they judge, and they malign, and they think they are above you, but they're not. They're not. It's just part of the sin nature. And uh, so this is the polari polarization of the sin nature. Now, if you're spiritual, let's say the spiritual life is up here, and you live a spiritual life by naming your sins, per 1 John 1, 9, if we name our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. And if we name that, we come up here, and therefore we're above all of that. And what happens if the legalist, let's say the legalist judges you up here, what happens to them? God will smack them down. He will, and it's a wonderful thing. And he'll smack them down because it's not their business. It's not the business of other believers to get into your business and to mess with your spiritual life. It's not their business at all. And a lot of times we let people run over us because uh, uh, we think that, uh, well, I don't know why we do it. I'm not going to do it. But uh, sometimes people let other people run over them, and they try to say that uh, this person's going to say something bad about me if I do thus and so and thus and so. Therefore, I won't do thus and so. But we're going to see in Colossians. In fact, let me bring up that verse now, because it's about time that we need to close. And I need to bring this verse up now. And I should have been through these two messages by now, but I'm not, and I'm not for a reason. But uh, let's, we're going to open our Bibles for once tonight anyway. So let's open our Bibles to Colossians 2.16. That will be Colossians 2.16. And that's it up there. Yeah. What is it? <laughs> Colossians. Yes, it's in the New Testament. Colossians is in the New Testament. It was written by the Apostle Paul, and he wrote all the great books of the New Testament. And it's written by the Apostle Paul, Colossians 2.16. And what does Colossians 2.16 say? And I'll wait for everybody to get there, so if you're listening on tape, be patient Everybody's turning through their Bible to get there. And so we will start at Colossians 2.16. And, uh, and uh, it, it might be faster to go than the index and just look up the page. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I found this Bible? Where? I found this Bible in in where? Dumpster, where they put the... Oh, really? Yes, sir. Well, that's something else. Trash well, no wonder it don't have an index. Yeah, <laughs> 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 that's not a complete reason. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, well, let me... I don't know what to expect to you look at it. I know, there's a lot of perspectives to look at things. All right, let's take a look at Colossians 2.16, though. Colossians 2.16, it says, Consequently, and this is the corrected translation, you say, uh, you say, my Bible don't say that. Well, your Bible don't say that because it's wrong. There's a corrected translation, and Colonel Thiem got this. I don't know the Greek, but I got it from Colonel Thiem, and I have no uh, uh, a compunction about saying that. I don't. I know. I'm not arrogant about it. I don't know the Greek. Period. I never studied it, but I did listen. I can look it up in the one someone gave me. Okay. <laughs> All right. So it says, consequently, stop allowing anyone to judge you with respect to food or drink, or in the matter of feast, a new month, or Sabbath days. So what is all of this saying? What it's telling you is stop regarding the legalist. It's up here. Legalism. Stop bothering. With, don't worry about what they think about you. When it comes to, uh, let's see, with respect to food or drink, uh, the legalist will say, you can't have a glass of wine. They're wrong. You can have a glass of wine. They're wrong. So when it comes to the legalist, 
uh, you start to conform to them. And you say, where do you get that from? Jesus turned water into wine. Did he not? That was the first miracle he did. And if you don't believe that, well then, you're one of these. A legalist. Now, if uh, also the Bible said, told Timothy, uh, actually the Apostle Paul told Timothy, because Timothy was a young man, and he was a young man who uh, knew the Word of God, and the Apostle Paul had ordained him to be a pastor over the Corinthians. Well, the Corinthians, especially the women in the church, started gossiping about him, and he uh, failed in that way. Uh, and then, you know what the Apostle Paul told him? Apostle Paul said, you know what, Timothy? I realize that you're having trouble in the church and you're all upset about that and you're having a mental breakdown, and he was. He was having a mental breakdown about it. And the Apostle Paul said, Timothy, have a little wine for your stomach's sake. In other words, have two glasses of wine and you'll be relaxed. And uh, therefore, that's uh, what he should have done. I don't know if he did or not. Uh, for all indications are he didn't because he ended up not being the pastor of that church for very long. So uh, that's what the Apostle Paul said. So uh, though from uh, Colossians 2.16, stop allowing anyone to judge you with respect to food or drink. So if you have a bottle of wine out on your, uh, by way of application, and this is a true application, and it might seem shocking to you, especially if you've been around here. If you live around here, this would be shocking. But I don't care how shocking it is. <laughs> so you have a bottle of wine just sitting on your table, and somebody comes over and they say, well, what are you doing with that uh, bottle of wine? Well, that's none of their business. They're legalists, and if you conform to that, well, you have conformed in it. That's why Colossians says here, Stop! Stop allowing anyone to judge you with respect to food or money. And do you know what happens? It's a wonderful thing. When you stop conforming to those people, do you know what they do? They leave you alone. And that's wonderful. Do you know how wonderful it is not to have somebody come around that's, that's like that? Well, my goodness, it's so peaceful. I moved to Austin, Texas. I've been around legalists my whole life until I moved to Austin, Texas. And when I moved to Austin, Texas, there were no legalists around. Now, there were people out on their porch smoking pot, and that's another issue. And they were doing that, but they didn't bother me. They didn't bother me at all, so it was fine. And I had a peaceful time in Austin, Texas, and it was wonderful. And that's what happens when you follow Colossians 2.16, which says, Consequently, stop allowing anyone to judge you with respect to food or drink, or in the matter of feast, new month, or Sabbath days. And that is, people say you shouldn't work on the Sabbath. There's no Sabbath anymore. That, that's, but we'll study this when we get to Hebrews. There's no Sabbath for us. Any, now, there's a Sabbath in the faith rest, faith rest real, and that means rest. What we do as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ is we rest in the faith rest real. That's our Sabbath. And our Sabbath is not just Sunday. Our Sabbath is every day. We have a set to, tonight is Tuesday, and it's eight o'clock, and I'll let you go in a minute, even though I don't want you, I don't want to, but I will. And so I'll just I'll close it up here uh, with a very moving speech. No, but uh, when I was coming down here on eighty five, and we have the the churches all up and down through there, and they say that you have to follow the Sabbath. In other words, don't go work at your Walmart or whatever. You have to go to eat afterwards and make those poor waitresses run around. Hypocrites! That's what they are. They'll make the poor waitress run around and do all that work and say you shouldn't work on the Sabbath, yet they're eating at a restaurant. What's wrong with these people? They're hypocrites. And, and, and we don't have this here. And it's wonderful that we don't have this here at this church. And it is a church. You say, well, there's not very many people here. So what? It's a church. It's a church with a few people who want to listen to the Word of God. And that's wonderful. So, where was I? There were churches all up and down the street in the highway, uh, 28 and 85, and whatever this is, at 24 out here, and whatever that is. And so, uh, we're here at church tonight, and we're here to listen to the Word of God. And we're not here to uh, judge each other. 
We're not here to gossip about each other. Do you know most people go to church to gossip about each other? That's what they do. And they look at each other and they gossip about each other. And that's a terrible thing. And it's an uncomfortable situation. And that's what happens in every church around here. You won't get this here. And that's wonderful. So I'm trying to remember exactly what I wanted to say. And I will remember it shortly. Uh, God the Holy Spirit will spark my mind in a second. So let me, uh, let's look at Colossians 2.16. And God the Holy Spirit will spark my memory from that. Colossians 2.16. Consequently, stop allowing anyone to judge you with respect to food or drink or in the matter of feast new month or Sabbath days, and that's what I was saying. Because in the Sabbath, people say, uh, respect the Sabbath, don't work on Sunday. That was for Israel. That was written in the Old Testament for Israel. Israel. We're not Israelites. We're Americans. And on Sunday, if we want to work, we have the freedom to work. It has, Like I was saying, Sabbath means we have a rest every day. In this church age, we have something phenomenal. We have the unique spiritual life day after day after day after day. It has nothing to do with just Sunday. There's nothing special about Sunday, but there is something special about the spiritual life that you have in here. When God the Father, do you know God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit indwells you? And when God the Father, God the Son, and Holy Spirit indwells you, it makes the Shekinah glory, which means you have within you uh, the possibility for the greatest unique spiritual life that you could ever live. Do you know that? And do you know that Sunday, a day, has nothing to do with it? You can live this life every day. It has to do with the unique spiritual life, not with Sunday. Nothing to do with a day. And that's what Colossians is telling us from the Apostle Paul. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity this evening to study your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and take these things that we have noted and make them a blessing and a challenge to us. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.